The following program includes graphic images and mature subject matter intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. The 2011 uprising in Egypt was one of the high points of the Arab Spring. It produced stories of great tragedy and great heroism. But here's a story you probably haven't heard. How a celebrated broadcaster named Mohammed Gohar stepped away from the bright TV lights and used his position and his studio to save a group of Coptic Christians from almost certain massacre. After the ordeal, Gohar came to Canada. And tonight, for the first time, he tells his harrowing story to our Sean Mallon. <laughs> January 2011. In one of the world's oldest nations, something new and stunning is unfolding in the heart of the capital. The spirit of Tahrir Square, nothing happened like this before. And I wasn't expecting it to happen. It was this wave of the young people call for a change and the look for democracy. In the central moment of the Arab Spring, Egyptians were massing, rising, challenging the iron rule of Hosni Mubarak. Leading the way were the young. It was a, an inspiration for everyone that I'm not going to take this life. I want to change. I want a much better political system. I want to express my ideas. Mohammed Gohar, nicknamed the media pharaoh, has been a TV journalist for 30 years. His camera captured images of Anwar Sadat, Yasser Arafat, Peter Jennings, and Barbara Walters. He became an entrepreneur, starting dozens of TV stations throughout the Middle East. But now, what was happening in Tahrir Square was teaching Gohar something new. First of all, I was Im impressed by how the young people use the social media to express themselves. And all these young people who launch songs and cartoons and all the people who start to give performance of how they look to peace and freedom was, was really amazing to me. Were and they teaching you? Were they teaching the old media guy new tricks? Of course. I learned one sim simple fact that I shouldn't think for the others anymore. Our generation of broadcasters, you wake up in the morning and you think for the others. I was told by the young people of Tahrir Square that this, this is no longer working. Did you really believe something was changing for the better? Of course, I believed and I still believe that something will change and will never go back. And so was born an idea for a revolutionary kind of TV station. Gohar scoured social media for the most talented, articulate, and passionate voices in the crowd. They became the original staff of a station he called 25 TV, named after the 25th of January, the date the protests began. 25 TV, I tried as much as I can to keep the spirit of the early days of the Egyptian revolution and to to give a platform for the voices of the young people who started the revolution. We want, we want our freedom. No Mubarak. No Mubarak. I train them how to be producers and presenters in a very short time. But I want their experience to be more used, like how they did it in social media. We just stand in Tahrir Square, and this was our news studio. <laughs> It's not gonna anymore work this way, like we sit in air-conditioned room and write great scripts. We have to let the people, the new producers who has phone, give us their emotion and picture and experience. You have to be out in Tahrir Square in the crowds and the tear gas. Exactly. Dodging the bullets. Exactly. With your iPhone. Exactly. The Egyptians, for the first time, they respected the news. Nine months after 25 TV started, Mubarak was in jail, and now the army was in charge. 
uncertainty reigned. Egyptians wondered if they'd pushed out the old strong man, only to have new ones take over. Mubarak was gone, so no system was there. He took the system with him, hoping that the chaos happens and everything will fill apart, which apparently happened after this. Amid that chaos, an old and ugly side of Egypt re-emerged. <laughs> The Christian minority, an ancient sect called the Copts, found themselves targeted. Once the system, the, the police dictator system, start to get himself back on the ground, they start by burning churches. Fed up with the attacks and the lack of official protection, a group of Coptic Christians staged a protest outside the state broadcaster across the street from 25 TV. I was transmitting actually the cooking show when the demonstration first arrived. And after five minutes, there was a lot of gun shooting. It was October 9th, 2011, a day now remembered for what's called the Maspero Massacre. Walking in the street, it's, it's like a short distance of a few meters. I found many, many bodies. And I look and I found the tanks of the army are driving over the bodies of the demonstrators. A small group ran for their lives into Mohammed Gohar's station, where he was about to face a test of his humanity. This is one of the longest days in my life. Next, risking his life to offer safe refuge. They went everywhere like mad people, crazy people, destroying everything and searching everywhere. The following program includes graphic images and mature subject matter intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. On the street in front of 25 TV, a bloodbath is unfolding. The army and gangs of thugs are brutally suppressing a peaceful demonstration by Christians. The army at the beginning was shooting in the air, but in a few minutes, the shot was going through the heads and the bodies, and the tanks start to move, and the whole chaos and mass happened. Station founder Mohammed Gohar runs to his studio and is faced with a ghastly scene. I found many, many bodies, and I look and I found the tanks of the army are driving over the bodies of the demonstrators. But when Gohar stepped inside his studio, what he saw was about to change everything. This corridor, I found two bodies. One of them is middle-aged and a young boy, dead, shot in the head. And in order to get inside, I had to step on the body to get inside my office. And this step really shocked me. I covered many wars before, but nothing like stepping in your own family body. It's an incredible feeling and shock my brain, and I go inside the biggest hole in front of the elevator, and I found more than 30 other bodies, because our door was the only door open to save the injured people from outside. These were people who probably tried to run for their lives? Yes. 17 people had managed to dodge the bullets and tanks and run up the TV studio stairs to hide, pleading with Gohar for help. A man who had seen death, covering many wars, was now faced with a moral crisis. I think at this moment, I was given a chance to think about my humanity. 
more than my professional or how much I'm gonna gain out of this. There is innocent people whom I care and I love. And there is people with machine guns and uniforms who are trying to kill them. He had to make a choice, hide the Christians and risk his own life and the lives of his employees or give them up to the army. I took the 17 people to a, a somehow hidden bathroom on the 13th floor of our building, while there was two studios live on the air. And then the army comes up. Live voices in the studio tell the story as panicked staff are confronted by armed soldiers as the show is going to air. Did you hear that? The machine gun loading. He said we we've, we've been attacked by army soldiers and he's he's talking to the army soldiers to calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. Relax, relax, relax. We're not against you. And they ask everybody to lie on the ground and they ask for their IDs. The first one they found is Christian. They beat him. He's 21 years old, young man, beautiful man. They kicked with the back gun in his head and they broke his arm. They went everywhere like mad people, crazy people, destroying everything and searching everywhere. Except one door they didn't open. They opened all the doors, except one door, where Christians were hidden. They didn't open this door. They didn't find them. Unable to find the hidden Christians, the soldiers turned to Gohar, demanding answers. They come back to me, the soldier who was leading the whole thing, and he asked me, where, where is the hidden Copts? And I said, we don't have Copts. I said, but we saw them coming up the stairs, and they are the one responsible of act of violence against the army. The army wouldn't relent, threatening Gohar and his staff. He kept moving the Christians around the building. The army kept coming back, determined to find them. For 18 hours, continuously, I didn't sleep. And more than this, I didn't have a single one more beat in my heart. The aftermath of what was later called the Maspero Massacre was horrifying. Streets littered with burned cars, debris, bodies, and blood. Changed their clothes. Most of their clothes were in blood. So I changed them, give them the 25 TV t-shirts, and some of them I give them cameras, until we came to the priest. I asked him, to change his clothes, and he said no. Father Matthias was adamant he would not remove his cassock. He had a big cross chain with a big wooden cross hang. There is no doubt that he is a Christian clergyman. There is no doubt. And he said, no, I will stay in my uniform. So I asked him the last thing is to give me his cross. He said, why you want to take my cross? He said, I, I want the blessing. And I give you, in return, a Quran. I said, take the Quran this time. Maybe it will protect you. I was, of course, 
worry of the revenge because uh, those people, if, if you give them a hint that you deceive them and the, you didn't give them what they want and they carry machine guns, you don't know what will happen. But despite all that, Gohar drove Father Matthias himself in his own car and wasn't stopped. One by one, he smuggled the fugitives out of the building. You know, I'm not very religion, but there must be another power protecting us. So you got him out? You got the priest out? All of them. And you drove that priest yourself back to his church? Yes, all of them, including the church. And he was in time for the prayer of the martyr who died in the demonstration. Twenty Five TV had to go off the air for six days while they cleaned up after the trashing by the soldiers. But when they went live again, they were under threat. Powerful forces were now making life difficult and dangerous. I think this day was a final point of the relation between authorities and myself. Gohar had saved others, but now he couldn't save himself. His crews were harassed, his broadcast license canceled, and finally his satellite signal was jammed. I had to shut it down. Do you remember what day you shut it down? What the date was? Yes, exactly. I remember very well. It was October 2012. I was getting death threats from the beginning. I was giving death threats even from some people whom I hire for 25 TV. Gohar's wife and four children were already safe in Canada. He had sent them earlier, knowing that life in Egypt was getting too difficult. And now he knew it was time for him to go too. He had no choice but to abandon 25 TV, a media project he had hoped would be a platform for truth and the revolutionary voice of the young. It must tear at your heart to leave your country. There is always a new beginning. I believe all my life that I'm just starting. So why not start a new one? What happened to 25 TV is exactly what happening to the Egyptian revolution, but it's not the end. The people I, I, I raised in 25, I am sure wherever they go, they will still carry the message. And that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.